freaking first cut. Golly! Welcome to the First Cut Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your DFS preview for this week's Houston Open. Joining me to break it all down, Greg Ducharme is here. Hello, Greg. Or should I say, howdy, Greg. Howdy. Yes, uh, the Houston Open. And, and a new spot in the schedule, which is kind of cool because, look, this is a big-time golf course. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I'm excited to have it in this slot of the year as players are getting ready for the Masters. So we got some really good players playing this week. Um, getting perhaps their final tune up before Augusta national. We got a lot of guys trying to get into the field at the masters for the first time or, or for this year. Um, so there's some, there's some big things to play for this week. I mean, let, let's just not waste it. Let's just jump right into it. Uh, Troy, let's if you share, share my screen, fire away. So Memorial park is the golf course. Now you mentioned a couple of quirks already out of the gate here. First off, this was a, a redesigned golf course. Uh, in 2019, Tom Doak, and there has been three editions of this tournament played since the redesign and since they moved it back to Memorial Park. The 2023 version, I guess, doesn't really exist, Greg, because this used to be the fall, a fall event. It played in October or November. They did not play this in November of 2023 because it got a spot here in the calendar year schedule in a March time slot. So here we are at the end of March, which I assume is going to make things play a little bit differently. So there's like a lot of wrinkles that we've got to iron out here. Yeah, there, there are quite a few. Um, one, it definitely carries a different meaning, the event as a whole, right? It's a, uh, we are right before the start of the major championship season. So that's one thing. Um, it, being in the fall, it's a nice place to get a start. A lot of guys chose it as their maybe their single event of the fall when it was when it was there because it is a big golf course it's a tough golf course you look at this scorecard yeah. and i mean you got five you got five par fours over 490 All right they're they're long you got three par fives which are also long uh and five par threes which aren't all that long but you're still talking about a 7400 yard par 70 golf course so it is a lot of iron shots from outside of 200 yards. I mean, last year it was a, a third of the iron shots were outside of 200 yards. Yeah. So that, that's a significant challenge for the players. Yeah, it is interesting the way that the, the scorecard is like, it, it's, yeah, you, you look through the scorecard and you're like, wait, that's kind of interesting. Oh, oh, that, that too. Oh yeah, this is, this is kind of weird too. So it does create this little bit of a test. Do we have any, do we have any idea what the difference is between an October or a November Houston open and a March Houston open in relative to the golf course and how it might play. I don't know to the degree of like firmness, like if it's going to play shorter or longer, uh, but you do have a different green surface because they, they overseed. Um, so you're going to have a surface similar to We've had this overseed at, I think, TPC Sawgrass, uh, the American Express, um, some of these Bermuda courses early in the year, we've had this overseed, which creates a really smooth putting surface, quite frankly. And, that, and that's different than the traditional Bermuda that they played in the in the fall. Uh, but beyond that, I'm not expecting too many dramatic differences. With three years of history and maybe subtle distances or uh, differences, excuse me, how much weight are you putting on course history compared to other years or uh, excuse me, other events? Uh, it's a fascinating question, Rick, because is it course history or is it course style? You know, th- this is very uh, specific when you look at some of these proximity buckets, right? I mean, distance is very important which it's important everywhere, but it's a lot more important than it was at the Valspar last week. We have Peter Malnati win. Uh, It's a lot more important than it was at the Players' Championship, uh, and a lot more important than it was at the Cognizant Classic. So when you look at recent form, it it brings some things into question, right? Just because you're playing well, now you're going to face an entirely different test coming to this golf course. And if you were struggling, 
with with some of these tricky Florida golf courses with a lot of penalties off the tee, a lot of water to negotiate. You don't really have that issue here. So I, I'm, I'm looking at recent form uh, with a more of a quizzical eye. Uh, I'm looking at course history for sure, but it is limited. Uh, and I'm, I don't think there's enough to really go alone on course history. So I was going to ask you the same thing. Like, How much are you looking at recent form here? Um, do you look at these specifics? Do you look at a course comparison like uh, like Mexi- the Mexico Open, for instance, or Torrey Pines or something along those lines? Because um, this will be a driver-heavy golf course just like those two a long iron heavy golf course, just like those do. Yes. I, I do like both of those, especially Mexico and, and Mexico even has some good crossover of guys who play well at both of these places, which I think is interesting. Um, but yeah, if a normal week, so, so if a, in a normal average week, I, I would think the importance of course history is a five out of 10. When we get to Augusta national, it's nine and a half out of 10, right? Because that's so sticky. This would be two and a half out of 10, right? I, I would like it, but it's only three years. It's a different time of year. I'm not going to, you know, maybe I'll use it to break ties, but I'm not going to like consider it as, as its own thing. Yeah. And again, time of year is a big deal. Cause a lot of the guys, not just because of the way it may or may not play different, but players may have been taking a lot of time off leading into Houston uh, they may have come in really uh, hot. Some of them, you get like more of a variance. Whereas this week, everybody's been playing a pretty healthy schedule. So you kind of come in with some real solid, concrete knowledge of how guys are playing. It's a good point. Which too. is different. Yeah, that is different. Yeah, like you said, if it was the one event in the fall that some of these guys played, you had no idea what they were, what they've yeah. been doing for the last couple of weeks. Exactly. Yeah. Now we do. Interesting. Okay. Well, listen, let's start naming names. We've got a little historic spot at the top of the board. We'll talk about that. Uh, But first, we are going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. For the last four years, I've been a prisoner of this hotel. Ah, G-sharp, I believe. Why are they keeping you here? Why do they let you live? Most of my friends are dead. My house was seized and burned. You must never leave. If you do, I'll be waiting. They can take away everything. <laughs> but they can't take away who you are. And we're back, Greg. Let's dive into this. The cheat sheet at rickrungood.com. And there is something very noticeable at the top of the board. That is a three. That says Scotty Scheffler, 13000 Dollars more on that in a second. The others over 10k. Wyndham Clark is 10,900. Sahith Thagala is 10,300. Wills Altors is 10,100. Greg, I'll just point this out. Uh, in my database, which goes back, you know, I've got probably five years of odds and uh salary information. Uh, we've never seen a a non tour championship. $13,000 golfer. We've never seen that before. And his odds to win this, which as of right now are about plus 260, are about as short as they get uh, for a full field non-tour championship like setup. So that that is the expectation being laid on Scotty Scheffler right now. Yeah, and it probably should be. It probably should be, you know, the, the biggest question in Scotty's game, the only question in Scotty's game over the past two years, two and a half years has been the putter. And he's coming off of two very solid putting weeks. He's coming into a golf course that he plays quite well. Uh, one of only two players in this field with two top tens here. One of them was a tied second, the other a tied ninth. Um, this kind of checks all the boxes as you would expect. And you run out of things to say with Scotty Scheffler. I guess the one question would be, how's, how's his neck holding up? Mm. Right. That would be the only, that would be the only question. The, the only thing that's holding him back from uh, winning three tournaments in a row. I think it's very possible this week. I think the price on DraftKings, I think the odds uh, are, are both, well-deserved. I think they're fair and I think they're correct. 
I would argue he should probably be more expensive than this on draft kicks. Um, you know, there, he was $12,800 at the players championship, which is a better field on a more volatile golf course. And he won it. So now he has $200 more expensive in a much weaker field on a much more predictable track. And also, um, I, I don't necessarily, so, so the, the, the way that you would kind of translate the odds to the DraftKings pricing he is he is more of a favorite than his DraftKings price indicates. So, long story short, I think he should probably be more expensive than this. That's a good uh, it's a good point. Um and typically you'd see it the other way where like in order for you to win, it when it comes to the odds, you have to win the tournament. Right. You know, so typically you might have somebody who's a little bit longer who's been playing really consistent or playing really well uh, and they, they may not win but they're going to be a really high highly valuable DraftKings player mm -hmm. but Scotty's both of those yes that, you know he he has been unbelievably consistent for years the thing that's interesting about Scotty is you know even when he wasn't winning which is a joke um he was still showing up in what was what would end up being the week's optimal lineup because he was such a you know the second third fourth uh you know being the best guy in the 10k range scoring all those fantasy points yes it, it would help if he were to win and get the extra 10 points but he was able to essentially be of great value even without wins obviously the outright market it cares about the the actual number one next to his name the optimal lineup does not yeah, it's a fascinating thing. So I guess what you're saying is um, Scotty Shuffler is going to be chalk and <laughs> you need to be a part of it. Choo-choo all aboard. Um, I hate that. The, the problem is, the problem for me, and and listen, I think Scotty, you know, I'm I'm not going to be missing out on this. I do like Wyndham Clark and Scythe a lot. Scythe was my pivot. He was the other guy I wrote down. And Rick, you never get on Sahith. Never. Well, I'm never I never get him right and I and I rarely but I've I'm I've converted. I'm in. Look at the consistency he's shown. Yep. I mean, this guy's becoming like a real powerhouse. It's the third most expensive player on DraftKings. And should be. He's been putting great. He has Regardless of what the stats say, he has a phenomenal short game, phenomenally imaginative, which I do think is really important around this golf course. He's got plenty of club head speed. He's been driving the ball great. I, I, he, he seems to check all the boxes to me. Uh, yes, and I think the, there, there have only ever been two knocks against Sahith. Inconsistent, which he has solved, and can get very loose with the driver. Cool. Do it here. I don't care. Like, just go get after it. There was, I was just, you know, clicking around Greg messing around and I, I ran there. There's, there's basically no rough out here. It's going to start the week at like an inch and a half. It's not going to be very penal on golf courses with uh, two inches of rough or shorter. Scotty one saw him too. It's just, it's not going to get him in trouble there. It, it's great. And he's fine playing when it, when it's wild, especially if he's not going to get penalized for it. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I really like Sayeth too. Um, Wyndham, the all the emotion that he's played with the last couple weeks. Um, he looks so good too, and this should be a perfect golf course for him. It's got a sting. I just don't know. I, I I get very concerned with high emotional performances like the one at the players and what we're going to get the next week. The 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 concern here is um, uh, we're splitting hairs, right? Like I love I love the big three. I think they are I think they are great. The fact that Wyndham Clark has finished runner up at both of those events that Scotty Shuffler won is is nuts. It's a great accomplishment. I find Wyndham to be the riskiest. Of those three, um, you know, he missed the cut at Riv. He didn't play particularly well in Phoenix. He does when he's on, he's the best player in the field. When he's not, 
he does it is not that high level of consistency that we see from some of these other guys. So that would be the only concern that I have about him. If that's what you're looking for, great. I mean, look at his look at his radar chart. Like this is about as equal of a that's a perfect little diamond around the skill sets. I mean, he is just he's just been phenomenal. I don't think I've ever seen that. Yeah. That's that's really strong. He he definitely has an edge on Scotty on the greens. Scotty's been a lot better on the on the greens himself, comparing himself to himself. But that would be the edge I'd give Wyndham Clark. The only other guy that we didn't talk about was Will Zalatoris, who's coming off the miscut the Players Championship. Yeah, and he seems to be a pretty good fit here too, right? I, know. Um, I, I would have no problem with Will. I just don't like him as much as the guys above him. That's the only problem. And, and Will, too, he also has can have a tendency of, like you mentioned with the consistency with Wyndham Clark, Will gears up for very specific events. He's almost one of the more predictable players on the PGA Tour. Like, big event, hard golf course, Will Zalatoris. This is a hard golf course, not the biggest event gearing up for the masters it, there's some there's a lot of yes in here there's a little more no than there is with scotty windham or sahith he'll probably win uh, yes i mean i wouldn't be surprised if any of these top guys win but just just for full transparency i mean i i like um scotty sahith windham will that's that's the order. yeah i go i would agree with that order it's very close so if you like will more than we do go spend your money however you want to spend your money yeah i'd add one thing to that sure. uh scotty is well out in front of scythe yes pretty big gap yeah so just keep that in mind you got to actively for any of those other three guys to get in play you have to actively fade scotty scheffler i'm i'm almost always fine with that but I'm not really fine with that here. <laughs> I think it's a big four, Greg. I think it's a big four because I do think there's a pretty, pretty big drop off to the nine K range, which is Finau, Siwoo Kim, Jason Day, Alex Noren, Keith Mitchell, and Tom Hoagie. It is not, it is not that these guys are not great and it's not that they might not contend, but I, I think it's a clear, well, I think it's a clear one. I think it's then it's these three and then it's everybody else. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Because when we get into the 9K range, I love the 9K range. Wow. If okay. you separ if you separate it from the 10K range. <laughs> Tony Fino, we've been talking about for a while. I know. He's now coming out of Florida. We talked about it last week a little bit. You were kind of coming on board. I know. I was a little worried. Just when I got on board. Yeah, that's right. You You tried to temper my expectations, and I should have listened. I just don't think it was a good spot for him. I think this is a great spot for him. And, and like he's losing strokes off the tee. That's not going to happen this week. I don't know how he could possibly lose strokes off the tee. Oh, man. So that's going to get better. I give him a, you know, okay on the, on the poor iron play. He's gained strokes putting three weeks in a row. Like Tony Finau has something coming. And I'm going to, get on board this week and unless it's a complete train wreck disaster i'm going to get on board at the masters too yeah this, there's there is something coming with tony finau in my opinion you were foreshadowing that finau masters thing last week um which yeah, and I, I think this is a better spot for him than augusta yeah this is this is interesting right he's obviously been great in mexico he's been great at farmers in his in his career what what i find so like he won no, here yeah, he's won here. He's actually got the best. He's even with a missed cut. He's got the most um, strokes gained per round of anybody who's played here three times. So, um, what I also love is no one knows what to do with him. Look at how look at how fast the public moves on him. Riviera, eleven percent ownership. Mexico, thirty players, eleven. Valspar, twenty. We're all back in now. It's going to be back down to you know uh, maybe not because he's got got a great history here. But no one has any idea what to do with this guy. Yeah, it's tough to figure out. But I'm seeing the trends all pointing in the right direction. 
Um, and getting out of Florida is exactly what Tony Finau needs. It's like size. You know, you get a little wild off the tee. Good. Go for it. It's a no issue here. And I think the rest of his game is is really good. So I, I'm looking forward to Tony in Texas. Okay. Well, if not Tony, or even maybe with Tony, where where is next in the 9K range? All right. So I'll be clear about this. I think they're all playable. You can find a good reason on all of them. I ordered it like this. Finau, Siwoo, Mitchell, Norin, Hoagie. Finau, Siwoo, Mitchell, Norin, Hoagie. Just let's look at what Siwoo Kim, I guess Jason Dad left out. Yeah. Um, who I'm fine with too. I guess he would be, he's probably, you know, he's probably fifth ahead of Hoagie. Probably day then Hoagie sixth. May even be fourth, but here nor there. <laughs> Look at what Siwoo has been doing. I mean, this is this is phenomenal. It, it's absolutely phenomenal stuff. He has been elite off the tee for a long time. Very long time. I mean, you got to go back to the Open Championship for the first time he lost strokes off the tee. And before that, you got to go back to the Masters. I mean, it's been basically a year. He, he's lost strokes off the tee once. That's pretty impressive. His iron play this year, he's only lost strokes off uh, approaching the green once. And it was His, a tiny loss. Tiny. 0.28. The short game can be very good. Um, he struggled a little bit at the Genesis. So I give him a pass on that. The putt-in... He lost eight strokes putted at the Arnold Palmer Invitational and finished tied 30th. He got that fixed at the players, gained 4.79 strokes putting. It's it's really impressive. I, I was I know that there's been some good results. Like I remember him playing well in uh, Pebble Beach and Phoenix, and I, I knew he played well at the players. But looking at the stats, I was even more impressed. Yeah, you're right. It's definitely a much better profile than I would have expected. Um, even with some of the blow up spots, but I mean, he lost H, he lost nearly nine strokes putting at Bay Hill and still finished T30. Like that's, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. Eight strokes. God. So Eight. he's very live. Who Keith Mitchell. That? Mitchell. Yeah. Jeez. I mean, this season. This season, he's had three events gaining six or more strokes approaching the green. Rick, one of them was the American Express, which means he did that in two rounds. Right. You know, he did it at the at, in Mexico, where he finished tied 19th. He did it again last week at the Valspar. Putter's been an issue, um, but I, I don't think that this golf course has really difficult greens. And he finished tied ninth year in 2022. Putter's been an issue and weekends have been an issue. Weekends have been an issue too. So it does give me a little bit of pause because what's going on with the weekends? Weekend at the players. I get it. I guess Sunday. Last last week, Saturday was no yeah, issue. Saturday was awesome. Yeah. Sunday was awful. Peter Malnati. Shot 81 on Sunday at the players and won the very next week. So I'm I'm a little perplexed with Keith Mitchell. I love what he's done with his game. I love the improvement in his iron play. I think he checks a lot of boxes, but you know, are we gonna get another we we can't have a blow up. So um Norin, Alex Norin has been also very impressive. Specifically, the last two weeks, right? Tied ninth, last two starts for him. Tied ninth at the Cognizant, tied wow. 19th at the Players, a uh, couple top 25s before that. Now, I wouldn't look at this and say Alex Noren fits this golf course. Yet, you look at his record here, and he has a T4 last year, also a miscut. So maybe Alex Noren has something going on. Short game's been phenomenal. Maybe it's a better fit than we think for him. And yeah, Tom, Ho well, go the, ahead. 
we'll go to Hoagie, but this is interesting because this is a range that I mostly wrote off. You know, I, I was going to make a decision on, I was going to have to make a decision on Finau, and I thought Jason Day was kind of interesting, but this is, this is, uh, you know, enlightening to me as well. The, what Hoagie is doing, my goodness gracious. Yeah. Again, perplexing because <laughs> he's just hitting the cover off the golf ball. Like it is ridiculous. But the finishes aren't lining up. And I don't like that. I don't, I don't like that very much at all. His record isn't great here. Um, you know, he's right up there and all the he's the best in this field from 200 to 225, third best in this field outside of 200. Yeah. That's 2023 and this year. And you look at these strokes gain numbers and he's clearly doing a lot of his work this year too. Yes. This is okay. This is the Norn one I think was the most enlightening. Uh because I I so I can I can like it when this isn't a good fit for you but you find a way like the fourth last year and also go out and put a couple a couple of good uh performances together recently which is what he's done and that is not someone that I would have really done a deeper dive into so that this has been a very enlightening section for me yeah I I'm looking at this saying okay I like everybody I got some questions about everybody but I could play you know if you tweeted me and said I. Uh, I got I'm between these two 9k guys. It's like just make it just cl close your eyes and click one. Uh, Cuz I I it's really hard for me to separate. Um really hard for me to separate in that range. So I went with a little ranking. Oh, Jason Day we didn't talk about. He has a really nice record here too. Uh, um and a winner in Texas, does that matter at all? Winner in Texas, he has a uh, T7 in 2020, T16 in 2022. And his play has been good enough. Right? Florida wasn't great, but it still it wasn't a, it was far from a disaster. Far from a disaster. Yeah, you go to you go to Florida, you have a couple of just okay weeks and now you get out of there and go to a place that's probably a little bit better for you wow okay 9k i was i was ready to gloss over the 9k range now i'm ready to be an investor in the yeah. <laughs> yeah the hard thing is still this that scotty scheffler guy being at 13 13k yeah so you might have to skip after all that you might have to skip it all together <laughs> yeah that's that's the pickle the 8k range though steven yeager bo hostler aaron rye patrick rogers billy horschel doug gim kurt kitayama and the man that's going to finish second or third to Scotty Scheffler, Jake Knapp. Now, Craig, if you've noticed, the guys that I've gotten the most wrong this year, Sahith, Tony Finau, Jake <laughs> Knapp, they are making some big appearances in this show. <laughs> yeah. You haven't gotten Jake Knapp wrong. You you were on Jake Knapp before anybody else that I, I heard. I'm, I'm like one for one. Or one one and one. I'm like one and one. One and one. one. Yeah. yeah. You're fine with Jake Knapp. But this is Mexico looked like a must. And and the only reason I did a deep dive into it is because a couple weeks before you mentioned him. Uh and I was like, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, he's right. Um, and this is an even better spot for him. This he's going to a great golf course for him. The length is awesome. Short game's really important. And he's kind of proven through the Florida swing that he can chip and pitch off of all different kinds of surfaces he'll be fine on these tight lies yeah jake knapp is one of three playable options in the 8k range to me okay who who would who would be another one of those three options uh, another one would be kurt kitayama oh okay and i'm far more queasy about it um queasy is maybe the wrong word but this is purely a fit, right? The the golf course should this should be a great fit for him. The short game is not what Jake's nap Jake naps is. It that is nice to see starts. him playing playing better though. I mean, he was yeah. he was really in a struggle for parts of last year, and he's now only missed one cut since the Travelers. So going back to the Scottish Open, so he has started to put the the game back together. Yes, and it should be a great spot for him. 
Now, this one is the most expensive, but my but last on my list in these three, and it's Steven Yeager. Now, there's not a whole lot of storytelling in this one, but Steven Yeager's gotten longer. I find that to be very interesting here because he he has a, a top 10 here, uh, T9 in 2022, T35 in 2021. So with some good starts, with some added length, putter's been a little bit of a struggle. You could hope, you could go and say, hey, I hope that's just a Florida thing. And maybe we get an uptick in performance from, from Jaeger. But definitely third on my list. Yeah, the run that he was on. And I mean, I'm not ready to say the run is over. Uh, it was really, really good. So that it's, it reminds me a lot of the um Andrew Novak like you got like you got to give the guy uh, make him make him miss another cut you know make him beat me one more time or screw me one more time I I'm he has earned that opportunity yeah and look the t3 when you know maybe that was the last time he went for him that was in Mexico great yeah. course comp uh also t3 at the farmers another really good course comp a and the the slowdown in performance comes in Florida Greg miscut at the cognizant tied 44th at the API miscut at the players. A lot of good players can do that. You, you can put together that resume and, and play some pretty good golf. So I don't necessarily look at it as a, a, a really big loss. I'm with you. I'm with you. Well, we got plenty more work to do the sevens, the sixes and the fives. But first we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. It's time for the madness. And CBS Sports HQ has your wall-to-wall -wall NCAA tournament coverage. We got your game highlights, expert analysis, and insights all the way to the Final Four. Start and end your March Madness coverage with CBS Sports HQ. And we're back. Okay, Greg. Top of the 7K range. Thorbjorn Olsen, Mackenzie Hughes, the middle. Akshay Patia, Luke List, the bottom. Mark Hubbard, Victor Perez. Uh, this could be a, an important range. I mean, the rest of the show could be very important, especially with the, the prices at the top of the board. So uh, let's find some goodies here. Okay, uh, I'll start near the top with Mackenzie Hughes, who we saw perform last week. You may think, okay, not a great course fit on a distance-heavy golf course. But Mackenzie Hughes, it, this kind of struck me. He's one of the best players in this field from 200 to 225. Um, and he may even have, you know, I only did top 15, so he didn't pop up there, but he's like seventh in this field from 200 to 225. Uh, he pops up in, in the short game categories, both strokes gained around the green and scrambling. Um, so he's kind of got the long game and the short game settled and another one of those more challenging golf courses, a little bit of a grinders test. I, I think Mackenzie Hughes fits that mold. Look at his history, Greg. At Memorial Park alone, T7, T29, T16. Loves the place. Loves the place. And then, you know, I stared at this stat profile a long time this morning because I don't know what to make of Mackenzie Hughes. And I just see a guy who finds a way to get it done. Sometimes it's relying on the short game. Sometimes he hits it a little bit better. Sometimes he gains nine strokes putting, but he's only missed one cut since the Zozo Championship, he's got three straight top 30s, four out of his last five. I'm I'm coming around on Mackenzie Hughes. Yeah, I think this is, a, you know, if you build a lineup with all big hitters and Mackenzie Hughes is thrown in there, he's a great little change-up piece for a lineup. And I'm wondering, you think he's going to be chalky? Is he 7K chalk? Um. I don't know. I don't have a feel for this range as much. Maybe you get a little bit of KH Lee, who's got three top tens in his or two top tens in his last three. Maybe you get people going back to Damon, who's got, you know, back to back top tens and he's playing better. But I don't, I'm not sure anybody in this range is going to be super popular. Okay. Well, that's good. That That's good because I, I like Hughes for sure. A um, couple other guys I like too. I think Akshay Batia could could be a could you could see a step up in performance out of him. The play hasn't been great. Florida was 
tough on him. Um, but he did finish tied 17th at the Valspar. He is long. He is a good iron player. Could be things could open up for him uh, now that we're out of Florida. Yeah, agreed. Florida is not those courses are not the the greatest spots for him. Um, I did want to point out KH Lee here. So he did have uh, w- one of the round the, rounds of the day. I think on Friday or Saturday or something like that. But he had his second top nine finish in his last three. This this to me is boom or bust. Right, you might get a miscut like four out of his last six, you might get a top 10 and there's not really a whole ton of ways to see that coming. But, uh, I don't think there's a lot of guys in this range who have as much upside as KH Lee has. No, it's a good, it's a good point. It just feels like, uh, it feels like a chase. Yeah. I don't really love this range all that much. I don't love chasing that guy. Your boy, Davis Thompson could check some boxes. Yeah, I'm not that excited anymore. Yeah, I get it. But look, I mean, T24 in Mexico. Um, yeah, missed cut at Farmers. Yeah. I thought he played better there. Yeah. What about Joel? Joel, da- hmm. Joel Damon's been great. Plays well here. Plays well here. Starting to figure it out. He just absolutely struck it at the players, and then he beat that at the Valspar, he has a short game problem and specifically a putting problem. But like you said, maybe we just, maybe we just got to get out of, get out of Florida. I'm much more lenient with the put in problem. This is an easier golf course when it comes to the put in short game itself. I do believe will be very important. And I don't think his short game is in the doldrums, even though it doesn't look great at the Valspar, but the Valspar is totally different experience around the greens. Thick lies or thick lies in the rough uh, is totally different than the tight lies you're going to get here. So I'm fine with Damon. I'd be concerned if it was chalk. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see as the as the week goes on. Anybody, anybody else? I'm I'm excited about the sixes and the fives. Anybody else in the sevens that we need to talk about? Yeah, one more guy I'm mildly curious about just because he he just kept coming up. It's Adam Spenson. Oh yeah. Now I'll tell you what I did here. I was just looking at last year and a half top guys in driving distance, 200 to 225 outside of 200 around the green scrambling, right? I looked in those five areas and Svensson just kept popping up. He's third from 200 to 225. He's fifth from outside of 200, which surprised me. He's fifth or fifth or sixth in scrambling. Um, Popped up all over the place. And he did put together some good rounds at the Valspar, although it ended up being a T49. T10 at the Genesis. I'm wondering if we could see a a spike, a course fit spike from Adam Svensson. Speaking of putting problems, Adam Svensson's got a putting Yeah. Problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, ugly. The 6K range. All right. There's... There are some options here. Um, just just to you know break the seal a little bit. I mentioned him earlier. I'm in on Andrew Novak. Right. I mean, yeah, he, he earned he 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 stepped up to the bell, stepped up to your call. Yes, he's earned it. He is now got four top twenties in his last five with great looking metrics. Congratulations, Andrew. Welcome aboard. Um I also think, so if we are going to take this course fit situation, Joseph Bramlett, Cameron Champ tend to play well at, uh, they play, they tend to play well at the same time, obviously because their skill sets are so, uh, so close to one another. They both gave us little breadcrumbs last week, a 17th for Bramlett, a 26th for Cam Champ. They have plenty of deficiencies, but if we're going to play that farmers, Mexico, um, you know, Houston type of mold, these guys are playing decent enough golf to be excited about. Yeah. Now we had this conversation, I believe it was Mexico and Bramlett was the cheaper version of camp champ. Yeah. Now it's flipped, although they're comparable 6,600 for Bramlett 6,400 for camp champ. I'm, I'm just still much more comfortable with Bramlett. 
I think I am too. Um, you know, I don't know if his upside is as much as a guy who's won multiple times on the PGA tour, but I also think that, I mean, Cam champ is uh, in some category every single week, losing like four strokes. His iron play is terrible. It's shockingly bad. And Bramlett's can be good. Yes. Bramlett at least gives you uh, a little bit of hope that he might be able to hit this green or a little bit of hope that like he's not going to with one. Like it's, 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 I think it's that big of a difference. So I, I feel like there's a lot more ways that Joseph Bramlett puts together a great week. Camp champ. It's like, he has to putt really well. I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot more ways camp champ cam champs week goes absolutely sideways. Yeah. I mean, there's three ways, right? Yeah. There's only, there's only two and a half for Bramlett. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I had, I, I had Bramlett on my list. I did not have champ. I just right, can't, fair. I can't do it. That's fair. Uh, all right. But there's, there's more like this range has some course fit guys. Yeah, it does. Which which I kind of like. And another one who may be a little surprising is uh, Maddie Schmidt, Ooh. who Maddie Schmidt recently blows Cam Champ and Joseph Bramlett out of the water. And he's the long he's he's the longest player in this field over the last year and a half. Longer probably, than Cam Champ. Probably also has the longest putter in this field. Because he's a tall guy and he uses the long putter. Have you seen that? Yeah. Does it in a little different way. Oh. Right? It's a little like he has the broomstick, but yeah. it's not up by the guy. When I was growing up, I called the broomstick a chin putter. It's cl right. really close to your chin. Yeah. Um, but he has it the same style, but it's much lower. It's like upper mm -hmm. belly. Yeah. Obviously not anchor. But it's been working. But working really well. I mean, he's, he's got a T10 in Puerto Rico, T26 at the players, T17 at the Valspar, and he's a bomber. I like this a lot. So I'm I'm in on that. Um, all right. Can you when at, at what point, or is there a point where you'd be willing to go early? Uh, Gary Woodland. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've been trying yeah. to go early on him for like, <laughs> for like a month. <laughs> <laughs> I, for some reason, so you've already, you've passed that point. <laughs> yeah, I've been at that point for since Phoenix or whatever. I, I've been trying to play Gary Woodland for basically all of 2024. I, Love the ball striking, obviously. I've been waiting for him to just kind of knock the rust off, get back into it. It, it has not happened. He is putting horribly. But yeah, sure. But like, I'm not going to need much of a sell here. I mean, he, like I told you, I just looked at some of these stats. A little different way. A little more specialized this week than normal. He's right there in driving distance. Second in the field from 200 to 225. Uh, not not far outside the top 15, outside of 200. I, I guess the one concern and the reason I ask rather than state is I'm, I'm worried that there's like a fatigue and focus issue with him, more so than rust. And I wonder if that just limits the potential of a, of a spike week. Could he even, if he plays great in the first two rounds, could he... Is he physically able to handle that? Yeah, it's interesting because he really hasn't put many, even like back-to-back -back rounds together. Um, which oh, that's interesting. I hadn't I hadn't considered that. But the the reason I saw because I saw his history around here, you know, T nine last year, and I was like, oh, another reason to play Gary Woodland. <laughs> I I don't know. And even when I have seen him, because he's been in like marquee stuff, um, I didn't think he played all that poorly and then just something goes wrong. And it, I don't know. It's been, it's been very bizarre. I've tried to be early, but have maybe it is, maybe it is fatigue and focus and 
I don't know. I haven't considered just that. gives me a little like it's not a wrist injury that's healed that he's just got to get his feet under him. There's seems like there's a lot more going on which I think he can overcome. I just, I don't know what the timeline is for that. So, but he kept popping up. And so I figured I'd ask. Yeah, no, good one. But, uh, but the, I've, I've already passed that line of being early on. All right. How about, I got one more for you in the six case. Okay. I'm, I'm actually quite interested in this one. Although I don't know why he withdrew from the players. It'd be Garrett Kigo. Oh, uh... I don't know either. Maybe we can get Mark on the case. T16 at the Cognizant Classic, T32 in Puerto Rico, which is not great. But he's really long. He can get he can fill it up on the greens. Do you think was he one of the did he I I'm, I'm just going to wildly speculate. I do not know if this is true or not. But I think there were guys who on Friday night were going to miss the cut and had two holes to go and withdrew. I think there were two and I I don't think he was one of them. Mm, Okay. I think it was Silverman. And I think it was Chan Kim. You're sick if that's true. If the if you just nail that you're a sick man if you just nailed those two. I think guys. they both needed birdie. I think I'm I'm like I'm, I'm pretty trying. certain on Silverman. Well, Silverman was easy to remember because he um they they put out that social media thing on him. <laughs> Pract he had to hold a 92 yard shot. It was practicing oh, that and missed the green. I'm an, I'm an idiot. I I was thinking of I was thinking last week the Bows Bar. Yeah, yeah, it was the players. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yes, the Silverman. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I have no idea why I was here for the players. So, I'm going to keep my ears open for that. If I hear any injury things, I'll definitely be off. I'll probably be off anyway, but I, I think he, this is a week where he's playable, and there are not many. Okay, can I tell you something? Yes. Uh, I'm just uh, this. So PGA tour comms, uh, March 15th, 2024, Garrick Higo WD during the second round of the players championship due to a wrist injury. All right. Uh, well, it makes it easy. He's out, out for me. And then I believe he cited the same thing when he withdrew from the Dallas bar. Did, oh, so he withdrew from the Valspar before he teed off. That's right. Okay. According to the internet. Okay. Well, if it's on the internet, it must be true. That's right. Okay. So, sorry. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news there. Yeah. All right. Out, e- it makes it easier. We'll try Gary Woodland instead of Gary Kigo. Perfect. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> the 5K range. Eric Barnes, Hayden Springer, Martin Laird, amongst others at the top. The middle. David Skins, Jacob Bridgman, Mac Meisner. The bottom, the min priced golfers include Raul Pareda. JB Holmes keeps getting in these fields. Dawi Vanderwalt. Um, what do you got? I, I have I have the golden goose in this range, but I, I don't know if you want me to reveal it now or after we go back and forth a little bit. Um I'm curious. I I, I wrote down two names. Okay. okay, they're on a piece of paper, so I want you to reveal the golden goose. Okay. Um, I gotta find him now. I thought he was fifty five hundred, but now, oh, oh, he's even cheaper than that. Oh, okay, so it's not my guy. He's fifty three hundred. Oh, Martin, trainer. So really? Yeah. So last Why? last five, all over the globe. Chile at the Corn Ferry, T eight. Mexico, pretty good crossover. T19. I know he putted the lights out. Don't worry about that. <laughs> T5 in Argentina. Okay, he missed the cut in Puerto Rico. Then fifth in Macau. That is three different tours all over the globe. Four top 20 finishes in his last five. Three of them are top eights. One of them, one of the top 20s, 
is at the course we like for crossover reasons. All right. Hey, you got a case for it. I mean, that's it's it's a little flimsy, but he's fifty. He's fifty three hundred dollars. Yeah, it's definitely flimsy. <laughs> I don't know why that made me laugh. I thought you were gonna be like, yeah. yeah, he's definitely fifty three hundred dollars. Yeah, but you need they're all flimsy down here. <laughs> I mean, like Tyson Alexander. Was that one of your guys? Flimsy? No, he wasn't. But I just I see him here. He has a second place finish here. This is where he popped up on the scene, I think. In like 2022, his only start here. Come, he yeah. came in second place. Yeah. Uh, he's 5,300. He has a T16 at the Cognizant. Two missed cuts after that. Um, also a missed cut in Mexico, our crossover course. Perfect. Are you ready for my two guys? I am. Also flimsy. Uh, Rico Hoey. Sure. It's been getting better. And I I took note of him. I believe it was at the Farmers because he was like leading yeah, after he was round like, one. He was like first round leader. Then he missed the cut. Then he missed the cut. So I've been watching him because he, he caught my attention. It, you know, he went to USC. He's had a pretty good college resume. Uh, gets out here on the PGA Tour. There's been a lot of missed cuts, but he's made his last three. T56 at the Cognizant. T32. T32 in Puerto Rico, T54 at the Valspar. And he's like a driving specialist. He just has some short game issues. I've talked to guys who play with him and said they, he just apps. He is just a masher off the tee. Just like it, it, like you should watch it. If you can, if you get the chance, you should watch it. Yeah. I kind of get that sense that he's impressive. So could be a good spot. Short games. It is a legitimate concern. 5,700. Okay. Also at fifty seven hundred, feels like a like a a guy that we don't really know much about yet. But Parker Cootie, been just elite with his irons. Finishes have been so so. T sixty seven last week at Valspar. Um, what what I like about Parker is he's he's done what we've asked of him. He's yeah. incredibly cheap. And we've asked him to make the cut. And he has done that and sometimes a little bit better. And the only time he missed the cut was in Puerto Rico. And we weren't even playing it. We didn't ask anything of him. Yeah, it was like, no way. We're not not even considering this. So, right, he has, if you have played Parker Cootie in all like the non-alternate fields, you've been pretty happy with the results. Yeah. Unless you're expecting a guy who's fifty nine hundred dollars to win, which you shouldn't be. Well, I guess Peter Malnati, but like that, yeah, he has done what we've asked him. So uh, there's an elite skill set, which means there could be more. We don't know enough to say that there's a real problem or issue. Um, at the Valspar, he really struggled with short game, but that hasn't been the case everywhere he's played. And Valspar and and this event are completely different short game tests. So I, I think he's very playable, very safe. 5,700 play. Do you know how, uh, the ownership percentage of Peter Malnati last week? Zero, not zero, but close. He what was, was point four. So less than 1%, less than a half of a percent. 0.4%. He's the Martin. Uh, he's he's the Martin trainer of the Valspar, the Golden Goose. The Golden Goose. That's what we're looking for. And now, Mar and now we're gonna have two weeks of it, two straight weeks of it. Back Martin to back, pretty cool. Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. Congratulations, Martin trainer. We do want. We could do the recap pod now and just knock it out if you want. Why don't we have Troy run the open again? <laughs> just go, <laughs> go right into the Martin trainer has won <laughs> the PGA Tour. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay with that. Uh, is there anybody else 5k range or otherwise that needs a, needs a mention? No. Agreed. Not on my list. Completely agreed. Scotty Scheffler's implied odds. 27%. Does he win this golf tournament? 27% of the time. Yes. Wow. I, I really think so. 
They played a hundred times. He was going to win twenty-seven times. I th- I think it bet it might even be more if he really played it a hundred times. It, it, the number would just keep going up. No, they forget every time. It it just like a uh, Men in Black wipe wipe the memories yeah. start over. Again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Still, I don't think it matters what he remembers because he just. <laughs> You play it 10 times, I'm not sure he wins 2.7. Out of 100 times, I think he wins 27. What do, you, what do you think? I mean, that's Tiger-esque. He, he's not doing it for 10 years, but he's what he's been doing this year and last year is Tiger-esque. That's true. That's a good point. He's not doing it for 10 years. We're asking him to do it for four days. And this uh, is what he's been. He has been Tiger esque. I'm going to say, I'm going to be very brave here and say he, do, he does not win this golf tournament. All right. How very brave of me to pick the guy, the 75% side. Yeah. <laughs> I think he, wi- I think he wins. I if hope he does the win. neck would be the, the, the big caveat to me. Uh, is he playing? Is he playing the Texas open? I don't know. I, would not love nothing more than to go to the masters with a guy who's won either three or like four in a row. You'd have Scotty Scheffler. You'd have everybody else at the, like all these other PGA tour guys have been struggling or there's a big question about them. Like Xander is not struggling. He's been performing very good, but there's big questions about him. Rory has been struggling and there's big questions. JT and Spieth, big questions. Can't lay. Where, where has he been this year? Oh, by the way, John Rahm and Brooks Kefka and Dustin Johnson. And like, where the hell is their game? <laughs> right. Where are they? And then there's Scotty coming in with three straight wins or four. I think, straight. It, I think it would be amazing theater if he, if he wins. Let's assume he doesn't play next week because that feels like a lot. For him to, he he would have played Bay Hill players. That'd be like what five five out of six weeks or something like that. Yeah. Um. So I'm assuming he's not playing next week. To win three in a row, three in a row would be I, I would I would love nothing more. I think you're gonna get that. Hope I do. That'd be sick. All right, Greg. A lot of fun, bud. Um. Schedule for this week: Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Normal week for us and the Houston Open with the round by round recaps, mega preview pod on Tuesday. Get your one and done selections in. For now, big thanks, producer Troy, who does all the hard work behind the scenes. That right there, Greg Ducharme. You can find him on Twitter at the Real GFD. You can find me at Rick Run Good. This has been the first cut. We'll catch you next time. 